This video is sponsored by Masterworks. The image that you're looking at is that of the sun. But here's the astounding part. It was not taken looking up at the sky, but taken looking down at the earth. How the heck is that possible? Well, this is a photo of the neutrino emission of the sun. Neutrinos are so small and interact so little with other particles that nearly all of them pass right through the 12,700 kilometer diameter of the Earth without hitting a single atom. The sun produces a mind-boggling 10 to the 38 neutrinos every second. In fact, 100 trillion neutrinos are passing through your body every second right now. Don't be alarmed though, they're harmless. You can't feel them whatsoever because they're not interacting with anything. They're kind of like a ghost that can pass right through walls. In fact, it's estimated that a single neutrino could pass through a one light year thick chunk of lead without hitting anything. So the question you might ask, if they don't interact with anything, what purpose do they serve? Nothing is built from these particles. They're seemingly useless. Yet, they're everywhere. And in fact, you wouldn't exist without them. How can this be? What are these ghost particles and what purpose do they serve in the workings of the universe? That's coming up right now. I think you're gonna be fascinated by the story of neutrinos, which you'll find are really responsible for everything. But before I get into that, I wanna acknowledge Masterworks for sponsoring this video. It's been a tough year, headlines are filled with caution, inflation is high, and the financial system is suffering radical shock, like a sudden banking collapse. Even if your portfolio is diversified, you probably still suffered losses. Maybe a modern approach is needed to diversify. This is Goldman Sachs saying that real assets can help salvage lost returns real assets like fine art. Goldman says that art can protect your purchasing power. In fact, the last time inflation was this high, contemporary art prices appreciated an average of 20% per year, according to the Masterworks All Art Database. Masterworks is an art investing platform. They buy art outright, register it with the SEC, and then break it into investable shares. With Masterworks, you're investing for thousands, not millions. In SEC qualified paintings, from legends like Picasso and Banksy. Every one of their exits to date has delivered positive returns, handing back over $25 million to their users last year alone. But know that historical returns are not a guarantee for future returns. I'm not a financial advisor and you should do your own due diligence before investing any money anywhere. And like any other investment, there's always a risk of loss. I've put some links in the description, including important disclosures and the Masterworks SEC.gov page. Masterworks has 675,000 plus users and their art offerings have sold out in hours. But I've received priority access for all of you at the link in the description. I just found Masterworks to be a great way to diversify for myself and I think it's worth a look. And now, back to neutrinos. Neutrinos are one of the most mysterious particles we know of. And although they may appear to serve no useful functions, they are in fact very important. For one thing, they're ubiquitous. They are the second most abundant particles we know of, after photons. When a supernova explodes, 98% of the energy is carried by neutrinos within the first 10 seconds, not photons, as you might've thought. They don't carry a charge and they interact very weakly. This is why they can go right through the Earth without interacting with anything. You might ask, if they go right through the Earth, right through our bodies, and they probably go right through our instruments. So how the heck did we ever know they even existed? Well, they were first theorized in 1930 by none other than Wolfgang Pauli, who is perhaps most well known for the Pauli exclusion principle. He was trying to solve a known conundrum in physics at the time. The conundrum was that some of the energy in a radioactive beta decay appeared to be missing. A beta decay occurs when an atom has too many neutrons or protons in its nucleus. When there are too many neutrons, the nucleus becomes more stable by transforming a neutron into a proton. This is called a beta minus decay. This process emits an electron. Scientists had noticed that the electron which was emitted did not always have the same energy. Sometimes it had more and sometimes it had less. But since the proton always had a fixed value for its mass, they couldn't understand how the electron's energy varied. This appeared to violate a sacrosanct principle in physics, 
the principle of conservation of energy. Pauli proposed that perhaps a second invisible particle was being emitted along with the electron, which carried the different energies, allowing for overall energy to be conserved. But if it existed, it became clear that it must be neutral in order to conserve charge, be very light and weakly interacting, because it was not easily detected. Enrico Fermi soon after coined the term neutrino for this as yet undiscovered particle. Now the question you have to ask, how were they experimentally detected if they don't interact with anything? Well, what's favorable for detection is the fact that they are so extremely abundant, to the tune of 100 trillion going through your body every second. It turns out that if you build a detector large enough and leave it on for long enough, a small percentage of these neutrinos will interact often enough that we can detect them. In fact, they were confirmed experimentally in 1956, 26 years after first being theorized by physicists Fred Rines and Clyde Cohen, for which a Nobel Prize was later awarded. Their detector weighed 10 tons and was placed near a powerful fission reactor. The fission and fusion processes produce a lot of neutrinos. For example, the tremendous fusion reactions inside stars like our sun is the reason these particles are so abundant. How are they produced in the fusion process? When the sun fuses hydrogen to helium, this is a multi-step process, the end result of which turns four protons into a helium nucleus consisting of two protons and two neutrons. This process produces two positrons and two neutrinos. Now you might say, if that's the case, we should be as bombarded with streams of positrons as we are with neutrinos. Why doesn't that happen? The reason is because neutrinos don't interact with anything and pretty much pass right through the sun and onto the Earth. The positrons, on the other hand, being the antiparticle of electrons, are immediately annihilated by electrons in the plasma of the sun to produce high energy photons or gamma rays. But by the time they make it out of the sun's core, we see them as mostly visible light. So we should be thankful that we are bombarded by visible light instead of positrons or gamma rays. The neutrino emission from the sun is where this particle gets a little weird, and the mystery of its mass comes about. They were initially thought to be massless, but we now believe that they do have mass because the neutrinos from the sun went missing. What do I mean by this? We know how many neutrinos are supposed to be produced by nuclear reactions in the sun, and these can be detected right here on Earth. However, we didn't detect nearly as many neutrinos as we should have. This was called the solar neutrino problem. So where did this missing neutrino go? Well, it turns out that neutrinos, like all fermions, actually come in three different types, called flavors. The flavors are electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. Electron neutrinos were the ones we were looking for. But when we learned how to detect the other two flavors, muon and tau neutrinos, suddenly the missing neutrinos could be accounted for. Somehow they changed from electron neutrinos to muon and tau on their way here from the sun. This changing of flavors can only happen if these three particles have a non-zero mass. Now, what do flavors have to do with their mass? Well, this is where the weirdness comes from. I'll give you the simple answer, then I'll give you the more complicated answer. The simple answer is, that in order for flavor change to happen, some passing of time must occur for the particles. In other words, if no time passed for the particle, then no change could happen. But since flavor change does occur, time must be passing for them. If time is passing for them, then they must be traveling less than the speed of light, because at the speed of light, no time passes, as is the case for photons. Now, if they're traveling less than the speed of light, this means they must have some mass, because physics dictates that if they had no mass, they must travel at the speed of light. Now, here's the simplified version of the more complicated answer. Remember the uncertainty principle in quantum physics, where a particle cannot have a precise position and a precise momentum at the same time? That is, when a particle has a well-defined position, then it will not have a precise momentum. And when it has a well-defined momentum, it doesn't have a precise position. In other words, if we know how fast it's going, we don't know where it is, and if we know where it is, we don't know how fast it's going. Something similar seems to be going on with neutrino mass and flavor. When a neutrino has a precise mass, its flavor is mixed. When it has a precise flavor, its mass is mixed. 
So what appears to be happening is that on its way to Earth, the neutrino is in a kind of superposition, or a mixed state of various possible masses and flavors. This is called neutrino oscillation. Unlike the uncertainty principle, there's no reason why we should not be able to measure the mass of the neutrinos. In principle, the mass could be measured, but they're just so light and non-interactive that we don't have a way to pin down its masses precisely, at least not yet. The probability of it flipping or oscillating between the electron and muon neutrino flavors can be precisely calculated, and observations confirm this. The source of this neutrino mass, and hence the oscillation, is the mystery. We don't know why they oscillate, and this needs to be explained. But because this flipping or oscillation occurs, we know there must be some mass, even though we don't know the mechanism of this mass. We just know that there are three neutrino flavors and three neutrino masses. We also know that the electron neutrino mass cannot be more than about 0.8 electron volts, which is on the order of a millionth of the mass of the electron. Now, you might say, why is the mass a mystery? Why can't we explain it using the Higgs field, which is the source of mass for all the other massive elementary particles? In order to understand why, I have to explain in a simplified way how the Higgs field confers mass. We can consider that the Higgs flips the handedness or chirality of fermions if it interacts with them. So when we say that the mass of the electron is created by its interactions with the Higgs field, we can think of this as the Higgs field rapidly changing a left-handed electron into a right-handed electron and vice versa. This switching back and forth is energy. And because energy and mass are equivalent via E equals mc squared, this energy shows up as its rest mass. A heavier particle, like the top quark, would experience this flipping at a much higher frequency than a lighter particle like the electron. And that's why it would have a higher mass. This mechanism, however, doesn't work for the neutrino, because it stays in its left-handed state forever. Right-handed neutrinos don't exist, or at least we've never detected them. So this is why they're thought not to interact with the Higgs. So the source of the mass of the neutrino remains a mystery, and seems to point to new as yet undiscovered physics. And it confirms that the standard model is incomplete, which is not a bad thing, because this could be an exciting area of research for future physicists. Now, I stated in the intro that we wouldn't exist without neutrinos. How could I make such a strong statement? For one thing, although their mass is tiny, there are so many neutrinos in the universe that their abundance results in them playing a very important role in the evolution of the large-scale structure of the universe, such as the distribution of galaxies. And remember the beta plus decay I talked about inside the sun? Well, without it, fusion would not occur, so the sun wouldn't shine without neutrinos and no life would exist without the sun. Furthermore, neutrinos are also involved in beta minus decay. This decay allows free neutrons to decay into protons. Without this process, the universe may have consisted of mostly neutrons. So much fewer atoms may have been formed, precluding formation of life. So there's a lot of interest among physicists and astronomers for studying neutrinos because these seemingly useless ghosts appear to be pointing to new physics. And this might allow us to have a breakthrough in our understanding of the way the universe really works. And if you like this video, give us a thumbs up. And if you want to be informed for future videos from me, be sure to subscribe. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.